President, Vice President, fellows, guests, um, Julie and I are delighted to be here to have the chance to speak to you about our experiences in the course of putting on the Celts exhibition. A partnership between the British Museum and National Museum Scotland, shown in both London and Edinburgh, and also featuring material from the Society's own collections. It's very appropriate we can speak to you this evening. Well, now the dust has settled, the last objects have rather regretfully been sent back to their rightful owners, we thought we could offer you a, a curator's eye view of the process. And to talk a bit about what we hoped to achieve in putting this exhibition on, something of the behind the scenes compromises and the opportunities that arise, and at the end, review where we think it worked and where we think we could have done better, if you like. Our school report card for the Celts exhibition. And we're going to do this as a double act, um, not simultaneously. Uh, I shall start and say a little bit about the structure and the background to the exhibition process. Julia will speak on the British Museum um, side of the story and the, the general exhibition. I will speak specifically on the changes we made for Edinburgh, and then Julia will wrap it all up at the end. I suppose the big question, though, is, is why? Why a Celts exhibition? Well, it's because Celt is a word that sits in our lips and in our brains, but is rarely examined in enough detail. It's a word that sits in the popular imagination. And yet many of the views of the wider public, and indeed of some scholars, are still based on maps like this. The idea of a single Celtic culture, a people, a group of migrants, who wander across Europe bringing Celtic culture and civilization, the Asterix view of prehistory, if you like. And the work of the last generation of archaeologists has been kicking around and undermining this view, and yet it still sits in the popular consciousness. And indeed, I was disappointed to see a recent academic tome published this year still talks about the Celts coming to Britain in the Iron Age. The world is more complicated than that. And many fellows will be well aware of the debate starting in the mid-1990s, questioning the concept of Celts, questioning what we mean by Celts, questioning the understanding, the background, the evidence for it. This has been a hot, contentious topic. It is by no means settled yet. But what we can be fairly confident with is there is no single people or culture or group called Celts. And there has been a division in this debate between, if you like, the Celtomaniacs and the Celtosceptics, rather uncruelly caricatured by Patrick Sims Williams, perhaps, showing that there is no, the evidence does not sustain a single view, a single idea of Celts. And this is the kind of material we thought should be presented to the public. This has been sitting in the scholarly, scholarly literature rather than with the wider public. These things ought to be conveyed beyond the groves of academia. But why the problem? Well, this gives us one of the sources of evidence. One of the points that the, the Celtosceptics would point out is that our early sources referring to Celts, the Greek and Roman writers, start from the Mediterranean and look out, whereas what we think of as Celtic today, the modern Celtic nations, are in other bits of Europe. Is this just an accident of survival? Is our evidence lacking? Is this just where things happen to have been preserved? Or is there a problem here? Archaeologists would argue there is a problem, or many of them would. For there are differences across Iron Age Europe which make it hard to argue for a single culture and a single group. Take houses, for example. In Britain, in the Iron Age, essentially everybody lives in a roundhouse. On the continent, Nobody lives in a roundhouse. Rectangles are the things to live in. But this is not some early argument for Brexit, if you like, that Britain is doing things differently. For you can find a kaleidoscope of difference all across Iron Age Europe, a mosaic of different societies, from things as simple as pottery to things as deep as their beliefs in the dead. There clearly is no single culture lying through Iron Age Europe. But the danger is we leave it at that that we take this story apart and don't reassemble it. And this doesn't explain some of the things that do show links on a European scale. Objects. Objects and decoration. Things we call Celtic art. We take as an example here decorated sword scabbards of the 3rd century BC with at the top of them 
these devices, these heraldic animals, the symbol of a warrior in the third century from Spain to the Thames to the great Hungarian plain, showing you are buying into some kind of wider international fashion or ideology of warfare. So art links groups that are otherwise divided, and so too does language. The ancestors of the languages that we call Celtic today were widespread in the Iron Age and perhaps earlier. This is Patrick Sims Williams's data drawing on particularly classical accounts showing the distribution of these things is clearly a, a Western and Central European phenomenon. But the trick is to avoid any single simplistic essentialist interpretation. For language or art alone are not enough to make somebody a particular culture, a particular people. I drive a Volkswagen, but I am not German. I speak English, but I am not English. These, we can be far too simplistic in the way these sources of evidence are used. And this is where a lot of the problem comes from. Different scholars working in different traditions use different categories of evidence, but speak about the same thing. So ancient historians, use their sources to speak about Celts. The Greek and the Roman historians were looking at their neighbours. They are not an unbiased source. This is propaganda, not documentary. But they give clues. They give clues in place names and, and their personal names to language. And these language clues then get extended beyond the ancient sources. And they overlap partly but not totally. And there are people using things we call Celtic art. Not one style, but several. Not all the people talked about in the classical sources are using Celtic art. Not everyone using Celtic art is speaking a Celtic language. You begin to see the problem. And to further complicate matters, these darned archaeologists come along and get things muddy and dig holes and call some things Celtic and destroy other things. The easy answer, the simple solution, is to draw a big circle around the whole lot and call it all Celtic. And for too long, that is what people did. But Celt and Celtic are too small a word to take in the history of Europe over two and a half thousand years. We need to tell more complicated stories. And this is what we try to do in the exhibition. Tried to do in the exhibition. I must use the past tense now. It's a bit of a shock. We tried to look at one particular category of material, decorative metalwork and, and other decorative material, and see what that could tell us about the history of Europe. We were not the first. People have been putting on displays of stuff called Celtic art for years, and I've taken just the major exhibitions in my own career so far, um, to all of which we have lent material, from Venice to Tokyo to Bern to Stuttgart. People have used this stuff we call Celtic art to put on big blockbuster exhibitions. And in all of these, British material was represented, and in all of these, British material was marginal. The main story lay elsewhere. And you get the sense, particularly in recent exhibitions, continental colleagues are thinking, well, if those folk on the islands don't want to be Celtic, then they're not Celtic. We'll push them in a small antechamber. We want to make our material more important than that. We think the British material needs to be seen in a European context. In fact, we would go further. It cannot be understood except in a European context. It is a long time since anyone tried to do this in Britain. 1970 was the last international scale exhibition of Celtic art, again shared between Edinburgh and London. So one can argue it is long overdue to have this kind of exhibition. But this is an exhibition that neither of us could have done on our own. The BM and the National Museum are the two great collections in Britain of Celtic art, but neither on their own is as strong as the two put together. The synergy has been really important. That and the little black books that we could put together to go and see colleagues across Europe, to call on other material. And it's not just the collections, but the people. In Edinburgh, I would single out my co-curator, Martin Goldberg. In London, we would point to our former colleagues, Jodie Joy and Ian Lyons, and also to Rosie Weech, who was project curator. 
We've also drawn on colleagues from elsewhere, particularly for the medieval and post-medieval material, Heather Pulliam and Francis Fowle from the University of Edinburgh. Their help has been invaluable in the exhibitions and also in the book, which I'm sure many of you have purchased already. It's much more than just a catalogue. What we tried to do with this show was develop a core which we then approached from different directions. Two exhibitions and one book, all taking a slightly different slant on the idea of Celts. So what were we trying to do? We were trying to challenge the kind of misconceptions that I've outlined already. The idea, for example, that there is a single Celtic people or culture. We were trying to explore the development of the modern idea of Celts and where that comes from. Why we talk about Celtic nations and Celtic identities today. Critical for us was to set Britain into its European context to make us less of an island nation. But also critical was the idea that there was no single Celtic art. It should be plural. There are multiple different versions of things we call Celtic art. Several Celtic arts. And we look at the Iron Age, we look at the Roman period, the early medieval, the Celtic revival. Each of those, a reinvention, a renaissance, a revival in itself, drawing on older traditions at times of contact and change. And this will become a key part of the story, as Julia will touch on later. We also want to make the point this is much more than just art. These are and were powerful objects. These were the actors and the agents in European prehistory, not just the props. They did things. They told stories. They impressed and empowered people. But to convince our visitor of that, we need to recalibrate the way they think and the way they see. Because we are used to seeing things looking realistic. We are steeped in the dye of classicism. So we are used, for example, to coins with faces that look like faces. Based on the Greek tradition here, the stator of Philip II of Macedon with the head of Apollo looking like a human and a chariot and horses looking realistic. This is not how the world needs to be seen. And the Iron Age versions of the same thing dissolve the head into curls and coils and spirals. And the horse acquires a human head. It is not because they couldn't draw. It is because they saw the world in different ways. And trying to convince visitors that this is a, a way that you need to see and think to understand this was one of our great challenges. Take an example. One of the treasures of the British Museum, the shield boss from the Thames at Wandsworth, on first sight looks like scrolling vegetation. And then the eye runs along the leaves and catches another eye, and a beak, and a wing, and it morphs into a bird, chasing a second bird round about the shield boss. And inside the wing of the first bird is engraved another bird. Or are they just shapes and shadows? And this is the point about this material. It's deliberately complicated. The more you look, the more you see, but you have to know what you're looking for. This was not an art of the everyday. So trying to convince people there are new ways, different ways to look at this material, influenced in particular by work in the anthropology of art, was one of our key tasks in the course of this. How, though, did we do it? Julia, she'll tell us. <laughs> thank you. And thank you everyone very much for the invitation to um, speak to you today. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we actually put together um, the narrative of the exhibition. Uh, and this was very much uh, a joint process, as Fraser has talked about, particularly in the early stages, as we were coming up with a shared framework that we would then approach slightly differently in our two institutions. Um, and that was really centred at the beginning around um, the book itself um, as well, which is obviously one of the first parts of the project uh, to come to fruition. And so I'm going to be telling the story largely from the perspective of the, the museum, but some of these are, um, are parts that we did um, together. Of course, as Fraser has outlined, an enormous amount of ink um, has been spilled um, in this discussion of the Celts um, and who the Celts are. And it was our job as museum curators to find a way to approach that story um, that allowed us 
to use our objects and our collections to tell the story um, and also to engage the wider public and to present it in a way um, that would be intelligible to them um, and approachable to them in their visit. And so this um, refers to the, the British Museum exhibition, but to a certain extent these were sort of shared constraints. And when we began putting the exhibition together at the British Museum, and I should um, emphasise that um, colleagues before me were involved in this uh, long before I came to the museum at all, um, most uh, particularly um, Jodie Joy, Fraser has mentioned already, and Ian Lines, who began um, the, the kind of curation process at the BM um, before moving on to other roles. Um, but it was always known that it was going to be an exhibition which would take place um, in the new exhibition gallery, um, recently opened or fairly recently, um, in the BM, which is an enormous cavernous space um, which has both uh, pros and cons to it, um, as we'll see a little bit when we talk about the design. Uh, it was always um, designed and envisioned as something that would be large enough to hold this Viking longboat, uh, which appeared um, in the, the first show in that space, the Vikings exhibition. Um, and that, obviously, is people dealing with slightly smaller objects for most of what we were doing with um, our show, that has both good things and bad things about working in a space at that scale. Um, through long expertise in doing this, um, people um, other than myself at the BM have come up with um, frameworks for what they feel works for an exhibition. Um, and so we were told, outlined to us, that we should try and tell our story in about five sections. Uh, and that we could have in that space probably around about 300 objects. Uh, depending on what you count as an object, we either had fewer than that or astronomically more than that, uh, if you count uh, the whole of the, all the objects from the Snedish and Hordes, for example, um, which is probably best not to do. Um, probably around about 20 lenders, a lot of that is for reasons of cost, um, and around 175 what we call stops, uh, which sounds like quite a lot, but is less than you think when you come to writing the exhibition. And this is anything, not an object, um, but any piece of text, um, any interaction with the visitor, such as um, a piece of audio-visual, you know, a, a video or um, sound, something people can pick up and listen to. Um, because what we're aiming for in the British Museum, and Fraser will talk to you a little bit about how this is sort of similar or different um, in the National Museum of Scotland, um, but we're aiming for what is rather upsettingly called a dwell time um, of around about 90 minutes in a major exhibition like this. Um, the British Museum um, likes for you know to have lots of visitors to its exhibitions and for that reason we sometimes at busy times have a lot of people trying to come through the space um, and so that means that we want people um, to come in very much enjoy the exhibition but not perhaps stay for too long um, so uh, we aim for this and we ended up with an 83 minute dwell time for Celts which I'm told is very good um, but what this means is because as well we know that a lot of our visitors like to come in and read all of the text um, that we can only have about 15,000 words. Again, it sounds like a lot, but it isn't when you come and try and sort of summarise all of this work that's gone before you um, and to tell a story that spans over two and a half thousand years from around 500 BC to the present day. Um, some of the things are, are very kind of functional. Um, so the tone and the house style of labels, we work with interpretation officers, and I'll talk to you about that in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, and of course, things that you don't think about until you come to do it, like the numbers and types of display cases, um, which are fixed. So um, I think some people are under the impression that you know a big institution sort of goes out and buys special bespoke cases for all of its exhibitions. Um, and of course, we can't possibly do that, unfortunately. Um, so some things like that, you have to work with what you've got and find imaginative ways um, to make things work for those objects and for the story that you're trying to tell. So within this, um, we were trying to tell the story um, of the Celts. Uh, and this begins with selecting objects. Um, and for these, and this was very much a joint process with um, Scotland as well, um, we worked on what we call pin-up boards, uh, perhaps more or less exciting than it sounds, depending on, on what you're expecting. Um, so here what we try to do is take an image of all of the objects that we wanted to include um, and use this sort of section by section to start mapping out how we might group those objects, even starting to think maybe about how we might group those objects in terms of labels. If you've got 300 objects but only 175 stops, some of which are panels and other things, every object cannot have its own label. You have to think about ways of, of grouping objects. Um, and this for us I think was a really instrumental part of trying to actually bring the exhibition 
um, to life a little bit in our minds. Thinking as well about pacing, things like relative sizes of objects. You don't want to have all of your small objects together in one case or in one section. Um, you need to, to pace the visuals of this as well, because unlike reading um, a book, um, it really is a truly immersive experience going into an exhibition like this, and you need something that's going to engage your visitor and draw them in, but also draw them forward through the show. Um, so you can see here some of the um, suggested objects we have for um, the section that's the, sort of one of the first sections of the show um, and some of our later medieval material as well. Um, and in a bit I'll talk you through those sections of the show and how we planned it out. Uh, you can see here at the bottom, um, so this is uh, an, obviously an artist impression, a cut through of the BM. And for anyone not familiar with it, this down here is the space, um, cavernous aircraft hangar like space where the exhibition was. Um, it's designed to be a very, very flexible space, um, but it's also very square and very industrial and very grey. And if there are three things that Celtic art is not, it is square and industrial and grey. Um, so when we were working with our designers, this was something we really wanted to, to draw out and talk to them about. Um, and so I sent them lots of images like this, uh, which could be terrifying, but um, actually they were very, very responsive and worked this very well. Um, they were real studios, 3D design, who've done a lot of work previously with museums and have done other shows at the BM as well, including um, Shah Abbas and Afghanistan, if you saw any of those. So they drew on these inspirations and they came up with a way to incorporate um, those kind of swirling shapes and more organic forms um, into this very industrial space. And I think they did a great job of sort of softening the space slightly. You can see here in this plan um, these sort of curving walls here. And they came up with a way um, to um, hang what they called an architectural voile uh, from the ceiling. Um, and uh, so what th that effectively means really is that we have on, th this is obviously their, their model that they showed us early on in the design process, um, but as people come into the exhibition um, and wind their way through um, chronologically, and then back this way, um, then uh, they will actually in this section, I'll show you some pictures in a bit, um, have something that sort of brings the ceiling down a little bit, because again, this is a six meter tall space designed for seeing and appreciating enormous sculptures or a Viking longboat, um, and we wanted people to be actually able to get really up close and personal with these objects. As Fraser's shown you, some of these are very small, and this is, I think, a very intimate art that calls you to come a little bit closer and have a really close up interaction with these objects, and we wanted people to feel encouraged to do that, not feel put off by this very large and cavernous space. Um, so I just thought you might be interested to see some of the kind of um, things we did with the designers, talking about how we wanted to present objects. Um, these were some different ideas about how to present the Snedgesham hordes, um, and so you can see they're working even from quite an early stage on the idea of kind of laying out particular cases. They were trying to sort of bring those curves in. Um, and we also did um, work with them. So if you saw the exhibition, um, you will maybe remember one of the cases as part of the Snedgham Hordes that had all of these um, hundreds of pieces of, of talks laid out, looking a little bit as if they had just been strewn. Um, they were not strewn. Uh, they were carefully planned in to the millimetre by our designers um, who, who took a day to go through all of this material um, with us um, and talk about what we wanted to kind of bring to the fore and how we wanted to... Um, to lay it out. So um, it was a very, very painstaking process at many different scales going through the design. Um, and some of this will have been similar in Edinburgh and some different. I'm sure Edinburgh, uh, Fraser will be talking to you about that. Um, we did work to try as well and, and lift the colour of the space a little bit. Um, it's very, very grey. Um, this is um, Alistair, our designer, laughing uh, because I told him to put more colours in because all of the colours he is testing are grey. Um, but we, um, you know, we did this work actually bringing objects out of the galleries, laying them out, um, looking to see which kind of colours worked with which kinds of objects. The designers came up with a colour palette, um, which was initially predominantly grey, as you will see. Um, and actually one of the um, great things that Neil McGregor did for the exhibition, I think, was to talk to the designers about bringing a little bit more colour and a little bit more life into it. So what initially was quite um, small areas of colour um, became much um, wider and richer, um, as you may remember and as I will show you um, in a bit, if not. Um, we're also working on our sort of marketing identity and everything um, at this time. Um, we knew that we wanted the two shows to have um, either the same name or very complementary names, and of course um, the same name had to go on the book. Um, and to give you an idea of how this kind of process works time-wise, we had finished writing 
all of the book, editing the book, and we had written the introduction and the conclusion before we knew what the title was going to be. Um, so we were quite lucky in many ways that it ended up being something that um, fitted, I think, very well, um, both with the show and with the book. Um, and this is the marketing from the, the BM side, um, and you'll see that we wanted very much to bring out in our marketing materials um, the partnership um, aspect of the show. So we have here the Battersea Shield, one of the objects from the British Museum collections, um, and also um, the lovely stone slab from Monty Feith. So um, emphasising that partnership with NMS by including one of their um, stone slabs as well. Um, and of course the chronological range um, of the show. So um, this is something we were drawing at the same time as doing our 3D design. We're also looking at 2D design. Um, it probably easier to see these as I talk through the show a little bit. Um, but trying to sort of differentiate between sort of the different scales and the hierarchies of the text. Um, so um, on uh, this side here, you can see one of our main introductory panels. Um, and uh, within that sort of subsections as well as we sort of break the show um, and the story down. Um, within that we had, of course, as well, um, labels, um, and we included for the first time for the BM, um, alongside the main labels for objects, family labels, um, with the delightful Blowog the Boar, uh, who was there to encourage children to engage with the objects um, with exciting questions. Um, so these were developed by our family team um, with input from the curators as well. And we had a lot of great feedback that families actually found those very helpful for engaging their children um, with the exhibition. So hopefully it's something we might look to do um, going forwards in future exhibitions too. As part of all this, we were working on our text, things sort of happening at the same time as loans are being agreed and everything. Um, and I wanted to draw out a few things for you to talk a little bit about the interpretation process. Um, so we wrote a first draft of the text on the sort of curatorial side, and I've created here for you a Wordle. I'm obviously not going to go through lots of text, um, but the size of a word here shows how many times we used it in our text. Now you can see that from our perspective, this was very much a show about Celtic art. Uh, and we sent these uh, labels off um, to be um, addressed and, and discussed. Um, and what came back was a lot of feedback saying that um, actually, as a show that the British Museum was telling, we were trying to focus too much on art. And so something that we really wanted to do um, with our show um, was to try and um, make it a little bit more about the people, make it a little bit more about the history and the stories. Um, and so this is um, what our word cloud looks like um, of the final panel text for the exhibition. Um, and so you will see uh, Celtic and art, for example, have got much smaller. Um, and Celts, comparatively, has got a little bit bigger because we're trying to talk a little bit more about people. Um, and comparatively as well, words that we had been using a lot, objects, styles, decorated. We've been putting a lot of emphasis on um, the visual characteristics of the objects themselves. And you can see that we've used those words a lot less. Um, because we're having to talk more about people, um, I think it is not coincidental that words like may possibly, perhaps, um, are a lot bigger in the second word cloud, um, because by the nature of this, we were being asked to speculate a little bit more. Um, but, um, and interestingly, people actually get smaller. Um, and that's because we, one of the things we were really encouraged to do by our interpretation team was to try and find a great variety of words. So though we're talking more about people, we're trying to find other ways of talking about them. Metal worker, or um, you know, communities, anything that we can say that's a little bit more specific about who we're talking about. Um, though obviously in prehistory that's very different, um, very difficult. So, um, oh, and the one thing I will say, um, we were also told um, you will see iron age, uh, which Wordle has helpfully split out, but we're of course together. Um, and uh, we were told we couldn't use this because it was too much of a specialist piece of terminology. Um, so uh, I, I find it, we, we were, um, it was considered much better when we sent the text back, um, but I think it is not coincidental that ancient has become much larger. Um, because of course, you know, we're trying to find ways to, to phrase things um, that will be um, intelligible to the general public but also helpful for their understanding and um, you know that's one of the the challenges of trying to do this in a museum context so I'm going to very quickly just talk through the sections of the exhibition um, and 
this is our introductory section. And I think what you'll see when Fraser comes up again to talk a little bit more about um, the Edinburgh show, the introduction and the conclusion are perhaps the most different. Um, so this is how we addressed it in London. Um, when people first walked in, uh, we were aware from focus groups and things that we had done, that most people were coming in with the idea that Celts and Celtic referred to the modern languages, history and traditions um, of the modern Celtic nations. Um, so we opened with these three objects um, and on the wall in large um, words beside them um, this uh, explaining that the word Celts and Celtic has not always been used to talk about these regions to talk about these kind of objects and looking at how we were going um, to sort of unpick that that thread if you like um, and as people moved round into the second part of our introduction, um, they were greeted um, with the statue from Holzgelingen, um, going back to the earlier start of our story, um, and a very different map showing areas that the ancient authors had actually referred to the Celts as living. And of course, as Fraser has already um, spared, um, because apart from Brittany, there is no overlap in these at all. Um, one of the big decisions we obviously had to make about the exhibition as a whole was when we were going to start chronologically. Um, and because it's a show entitled Celts, um, and because we were trying to talk about people, uh, it seemed to make most sense for us to talk about the time when this word is first being used, has first been recorded around about 500 BC. There would be lots of other ways of doing this. We could have looked specifically at the first beginnings of Celtic art, which ties in with this, but not precisely. Um, we could have looked at languages, for example. Um, but because we were telling a story through objects um, and because we were talking about Celts and all the different ways that word has been used, this seemed like a sensible place to begin. So our first um, main section, the main body of the show after the introduction, after this we went through chronologically. We'd kind of drawn out the two extremes there, both the sort of modern use of the word and the ancient peoples first referred to as that name. And what we wanted to explore in this um, first major chronological section, um, which we called the first Celts, was that Iron Age period, uh, if I may be permitted here to use that term, um, but looking at what is happening in Britain, but also across Europe at the time when this you know, word is first being bandied around, we first have the word Celt Celtoy recorded, um, and the kinds of objects that people are using and making, um, and the ways in which these people are connected. And what we chose to look at here was the art and the decorated objects, as Fraser has talked about, um, showing those pan-European um, connections. But we also tried to look a bit at things that were different and to emphasize the fact that if you look at objects like, for example, talks um, and the big metal neck rings that people are wearing, there is shared idea, but huge variety. And so that perhaps we need to challenge the idea that we can consider these a single people. This uh, is what that section looked like as you were walking through it, uh, though you'd be very lucky if you came in and there was absolutely nobody in there. Um, and you can see here the um, sort of well that the designers put over the top. Um, and again, hopefully maybe get a sense of how we're sort of pacing the objects in terms of scale and size as well. Our uh, second major chronological section was the impact of Rome. Uh, what happens is the Roman world is expanding into um, many of these areas. And here we were focusing, narrowing down our focus more to be about Britain and Ireland. And we looked both at what was happening um, within the Roman province of Britannia um, with objects like the Staffordshire and Moorlands Pan, um, which are showing um, that although there is this idea, I think particularly amongst the general public, that Celtic art um, is something which persists in the fringes outside of the Roman world and survives um, in spite of the Romans, actually in many ways, this is an art that is being changed, perpetuated, through contact with Rome, and it exists perhaps in its later forms, which we'll see in a moment, um, because of that Roman influence, rather than in spite of it. Um, and we're also looking at developments that are happening outside of the kind of boundaries of the, the province. Um, so for example, the tradition of massive metalwork up in Scotland, the way that even um, outside of the Roman Empire, people's lives and the objects they're making are still changing and transforming. Uh, the next chronological section looked um, at what's happening after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, um, and particularly again in Britain, the development of both the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms um, and the Celtic-speaking areas, bringing in that idea of language, particularly um, in Western and Northern Britain and in Ireland, um, and the idea of the importance of the coming of Christianity. 
Because we were telling a story that is as well about decoration and the objects these people are using, um, we wanted to unpick um, some of the ideas that people have about what Celtic art is. Um, and one of those is this idea about um, looking at these sort of manuscripts and things like interlace and thinking about that as being pure and simple Celtic art and a development of, you know, particularly Scotland, Wales and Ireland. Um, and we showed these alongside um, Roman objects as well as local objects to explore the ways that many of these designs come out of a Roman world um, and also draw on a very, very wide variety of influences, um, not least um, Germanic ones. So, um, for example, we displayed um, one of the lovely Anglo-Saxon buckles um, from the Faversham Cemetery down in Kent, um, alongside, um, not this particular brooch, but other pieces um, of jewellery from the Celtic-speaking world, um, to show that although people tend to think about interlace as Celtic, actually it's much more complex than that. Um, and this is a sort of fusion art style that is coming about in another time of contact, another time of great social change. And um, our next chronological section um, was about the Celtic revival. And this is where we started to come back um, to say that all of those things that we have been looking at since the kind of Roman period hadn't actually been called Celtic at the time. The people who made them and the people who spoke languages that today we call Celtic um, didn't have that name Celts associated with them um, until at the earliest, the, the 1500s, and that really it was in the 1700s that in particular the languages are first given that name. So we're looking at the academic history of the um, reinvention of the word Celts um, and how that gets applied to something that it hadn't previously been used to describe. Um, we marked the beginning of this section um, with the inclusion of Caractacus, um, marble statue from um, the, well, um, in the care of the collections of the Guildhall, but actually normally housed at uh, Mansion House, home of the um, Lord Mayor of London. Um, he had to be winched out uh, in the small hours of the morning when an entire road could be closed. They had to take down, I think, three chandeliers in order to be able to get to him. Um, so we were very, very lucky to have him uh, able to come and join us. Um, and we looked at the way that this sort of revival of the idea of the Celts, the idea of a um, Celtic heritage, being applied to those regions newly of Scotland, Ireland, Wales, um, and of course Cornwall, Brittany and the Isle of Man as well, um, was really picked up on, really developed as those regions and were really emphasising their own local identities and histories and traditions that were very different to England and the English. We finished, and again this is one of the differences between the exhibitions, um, with a section um, on the present, um, kind of bringing the exhibition up to the modern day. Um, some of this was based around objects, some of this was based around um, a piece um, of sort of audio-visual, um, which you may or may not have seen in the exhibition, looking at modern day Celtic festivals, um, but trying to pick up a little bit on the, the politics and identity of um, Celtic identities in the modern world, and the fact um, that something which was a local identity with the Celtic diaspora has actually become very much a global story. And so that was the story in London. Um, and with that, I will hand back over to Fraser, who is going to tell you a little bit about Edinburgh. Thanks, Julia. Well, we were very keen that um, we were more than just London light that in doing the exhibition in Edinburgh, it was our version of this material, not just the same thing. In part, that was for practical reasons. We have a smaller space. Our space is 650 square metres. London is, I think, 1,100. Um, it's also not as high. Rather than the towering six metres, we have a mere four metres, so we can't fit long ships into our gallery. But we're also very aware we were putting this exhibition on in Edinburgh and not in London. We're putting it on in a city where many people will either think of themselves as Celts or will have a view of Celtic which is different from what is the case in London. We were also aware our audience like to get their money's worth. 90 minutes is barely the beginning of it. We have discovered, I am not pandering to any stereotypes about Scots here, if people pay for an exhibition, they are darn well going to read every single word that they expect, audiovisuals, they expect lights, <coughs> dancing, all kinds of things. So we, in general with our exhibitions, we put in a lot more audiovisual content. 
And this for us was really good because we could have some big screen presentations to tell more of the context and background that the objects can't carry, always of themselves, but also in-depth touch screens where people could explore the decoration, explore the background, look at some of the archaeological evidence behind this material, the excavations for example. This gives you an idea of the context and two of our themes which were colour coded differently. You'll see the height is rather different, but we tried hard to make sure there were recognisable links between the exhibitions. So, um, Real Studios, who'd done the London design, did the initial scheme design, the overall design for Edinburgh, and we then worked with an Edinburgh-based design company, Real Studios, and our own teams to apply this and morph this into what we could fit into our space. So, sharing the concept, sharing the core and some of the design language, but it was redesigned, redisplayed, and rewritten for our show. But we tried to keep the core of it similar. So we have the three core blocks, the Iron Age, the Roman, the early, medieval are the same, although not always with the same titles. The first Celts has become a connected Europe, for example. It's the beginning and the end where we see the big differences, and those I'll dwell on in a minute. You will see, of course, we also kept the cute mascot. We couldn't, we had to make sure that was there. He was the star of the show. Well, this is our introduction, and it's worth perhaps taking you through the text. You walk in and you face the whole Skerling and statue, and on the panel on the left was the following text. Who were the Celts? Celts is a word with many meanings, constantly changing through time. However, there has never been a single Celtic people or nation. Two and a half thousand years ago, Greek writers spoke of barbarians called Celts who lived north of the Mediterranean world. Today we speak of Celtic identities and Celtic languages in places such as Scotland, Ireland, Wales and Britain. Between these very different times and places lies a complex history which we can begin to unravel through powerful objects decorated with what we call Celtic art. So we tried to place, we tried to give a sense of time and place and some of the questions we were trying to answer. And within this introduction, we posed a juxtaposition and a sequence. The juxtaposition was what we termed myths and realities. Here is the myth, the 19th century vision of Celts, the Druids bringing in the mistletoe um, by Hornell and Henry. And here, an ancient reality, the whole Skerling and statue. An audiovisual just off screen to the left here, took people through the time and space and related it to the iconic objects. The cross slab from Invergauri for the early medieval period, the Staffordshire Moorlands pan for Romans, and Mesic terrets for the Iron Age. And in each case, the label was trying to pose questions. Created or crushed by Rome, for example. Celtic continuity or romantic imagination for example, to get people thinking about what was to follow. And we deliberately reflected back on some of these questions at the end, for our structure is a loop. So you come in at one door, you loop your way around and you're coming out um, 180 degrees around, uh, 360 degrees around from where you went in. We changed a number of things, but because the space, the space may have been much smaller, but we also have a smaller visitor pressure. As Julia said, the visitor numbers in the BM are very high. We don't get that pressure, and as a result, we don't leave to need to leave as much breathing space. So we didn't cut half the objects. And although we cut things, we also added things. I don't want to take you through them on a blow-by-blow -blow basis, but the result was we ended up, I think, with more lenders rather than less. 27 different lenders from 12 different countries for the Edinburgh show. But I'd like to show you why we changed things, the kind of things that we modified. So in London, this beast here, the head of a carnix, an Iron Age war horn from Deskford in Bathshire, from, in, from Murray, was in display, along with the reconstruction. This is normally in our collections. So our visitors can see this for free every day of the week. We additionally borrowed the head of a carnix from Mandar and fragments of a tube and ear from Abentoyer to show that the carnix was a European-wide idea but interpreted differently in different ways. Local versions of an international theme. 
And that, for, for both of us, I think, was one of the key ways of understanding Celtic art. Not the same, but related. Some of our editions were designed to expand the scope. Sometimes geographically, we wanted more from Central and Eastern Europe, so we borrowed the turrets from Mezek, one of our star pieces. We borrowed material from Bern, including the wonderful bear statue of Dea Artio, an absolute standout piece. And also from the Society's own collections, the Cotterdale Sword and Scabbard, which we were delighted to get to, from our show. Although, if I was being pedantic, I would point out the photograph the Society had provided has got the handle the wrong way around. But this expansion in certain areas allowed us to modify and tweak our story in parts and to take particularly um, this, the Iron Age story further east, to take also the, the Roman period story onto the content for parallels as well. How you actually display material also poses problems. The Gundestrup Cauldron for both exhibitions was an absolute masterpiece and an absolute nightmare. We were delighted to get it the first time this had come to Britain and so central to the story, something everybody sees in books and videos and films of Celtic art and yet it isn't Celtic. But displaying it is really challenging because it's decorated on the inside and on the outside and in the base and it has lots of funny angles and it's silver which shines in funny ways. For us it was really the turning point of the exhibition, the point where we shifted story from the Iron Age into the Roman. And we put it, if you like, within its own cauldron, with a curtain printed with some of the images on the interior, allowing us to separate it off, take the interpretation out onto the walls here, and leave people to walk around the cauldron. But judging the height to put the cauldron at was possibly the most difficult thing in the exhibition. And even though we think it worked, we still had more complaints about this than anything else, even though most people could clearly see it quite well. But we also tried to set it into a broader context. You can't understand Gundestrup on its own. It is a really complicated object. So we borrowed the, these pieces of Thracian silver from the uh, museum in Vienna because they provide the only parallels for the the exact decoration on Gundestrup, and they're one of the key pieces of evidence as to why we think it's made in the southeast of Europe rather than anywhere else, this silversmithing technology. The first time these have ever been displayed together. Because this, for both of the exhibitions, was a key part of the story. The Gundestrup takes us far beyond a Celtic world. It's made in the southeast of Europe, drawing on Western influences such as the Carnex, drawing on Eastern influences such as ideas of the ritual bullfight, rather stylized elephants, yoga poses, and ends its life far to the north of anything called Celtic in Jutland, taking us far beyond the Celtic world and showing us again how one single world can't capture the complexity of what's happening at this period. There's other places where we shifted emphasis a little bit. Although we're telling a similar story, the beginning of our, if you like, medieval story started in the middle of the Roman period because we wanted to emphasise the point of how current scholarship is showing the roots of this material, as Julia said, <coughs> lie not in some magical survival beyond the edge of the Roman Empire, but are drawn from the Roman provinces. And in the spirals and the decoration and also some of the technologies and the materials, the fingerprints of Rome are all over this early medieval material. It couldn't have come into existence without the Roman provinces. We put a little more um, interpretation into the language issue, particularly with an audiovisual, with some Celtic language experts speaking about this material, because in a Scottish context there's much more expectation that Gaelic will be dealt with um, more extensively. And although that's quite difficult to do with artefacts, we felt we can do it much more coherently in an AV, and this seemed to go down quite well. We also emphasised gaps in the story rather more. So our early medieval story, we finish it around 1000 AD because the swirling, curling forms of art we've been tracing for more than 1000 years fall from use around this time. And we emphasise the gap between this and the Celtic revival. 
It's not that Gallic traditions are not surviving, but we saw the art styles as changing at this moment and wanted to emphasise that rather more. And in the final section, it very visibly reflected back to the beginning. Some of the questions we posed at the start with deliberate sight lines through from these crazy druids to these, this crazy druid, for example. And looking at the ways in which the druids were a very important way in which the Celtic revival understood um, what they thought was, was Celtic. We didn't look at the most modern reflections of, of Celts today, if you like, because we feel this is a separate exhibition. Particularly for a Scottish audience, it needs more treatment in depth. The idea of modern Scotland, the idea of 19th century Scotland, is not something we can squeeze into a few cases at the end. And it's also not something we felt, as archaeologists, we particularly wanted to do. We'd rather stick to the stuff we're good at. And this is material where both London and Edinburgh have a long pedigree. And in both exhibitions we emphasised how it was some of the founding figures of our museums who played such a pivotal role in identifying Celtic art in the first place. Daniel Wilson in Edinburgh, Augustus Franks in London were two of the key figures in recognising the styles which we now call Celtic art. Very diverse styles, in a way they're part of the problem as well as the solution, but nonetheless critical in showing how these museum collections are a key part of the story. And we finished our exhibition in two ways. We finished it with an AV, with a video, where the various people who'd contributed to the exhibition spoke about what Celtic meant to them. And we edited it to create a diversity of views, to show how there is no single vision. But we also finished with this image you see on the left here, a wonderful piece of revival art by the Dundee artist John Duncan, Anima Celtica, Celtic Soul where the muse dreams of a Celtic past and a Celtic future, with Gallic figures from Gallic myths around about her, and objects strewn or decorating her. We know where, where the artist got them from. Lifted from the catalogue of our museum, published three years previously. And one of the exciting uh, realisations in the research for the exhibition was picking up the catalogue and flicking through it, and suddenly realising we could pinpoint the exact objects the exact images which were used for the drawings. And this is really important because it shows us what Duncan was thinking of as Celtic. This was his vision of Celtic. Material from the late Bronze Age to the 18th century. And for us it was a perfect point to finish the exhibition on because we would argue you cannot bundle all these things together. Let them breathe and let them tell their own stories. Not one single Celtic story, not one single Celtic art, but multiple different arts. But did it all work? Were we successful? I shall leave Julia with the last word. So, the three outputs of our project, as you see here, um, the two exhibitions that we've talked to you about, and also the book, um, which we really hope um, stands alone and will continue to be useful after the exhibition um, as well. Um, I wanted to um, pull out some, some quotes and things. Um, I've picked lots of nice quotes. Um, we obviously, as, as Fraser said, um, did get sort of other feedback as well, a lot of it um, in the way that you always do about exhibitions, about sort of accessibility and access and font size and um, access to particular objects. Um, in terms of the press, I think we all felt within the museums that we had generally very, very positive um, press um, reviews. Uh, the Guardian gave us five stars uh, for the um, BM exhibition um, and declared it the number one art show of 2015, um, which was somewhat ironic given that um, the, uh, in some ways I think for us as curators this was the most frustrating review uh, because this was the review um, that picked up on what the thing that worried us most, which is that is, if this is something we are trying to unpick this idea of the Celts as a single people, this idea of all Celtic art as being something that you can smush together and it's all effectively the same. By bringing all of this stuff into one room, is it possible that we are going to end up reinforcing that rather than pulling it apart? Um, and we were aware from the beginning that that was a real risk. Um, and actually, despite um, Jonathan Jones and The Guardian, who obviously did love the show, um, 
I think we actually feel that it was well received and that it was timely to do this and that most of our audience did get what we were trying to say. Um, the idea, as, as Fraser has shown particularly there at the end, that you can pull this stuff apart into a much longer timeline and that not all of the ways that this word Celt or Celtic is being used are the same um, and that there has to be room for a lot of different interpretations there. And if you are going to use the word, you need to be clear about what you mean. And I think actually that is something that from our, our feedback, it does seem that a lot of our visitors um, came away with. And, and I think it was timely to do an exhibition about that because I think it is something that was starting to um, kind of reach the, um, the public consciousness a little bit. Um, maybe it's timely to um, tell that story um, in a different context as well. We had very good visitor numbers uh, between the two shows. Um, we had, I think, just shy of 240,000 visitors, um, which was on track for our um, sort of uh, goals. So that was really, really good um, for us. And it means we've been able to tell that story to quite a few people. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we had a good mix um, of uh, good comments from um, everyone, including visitors, but also um, press reviews and um, inter um, academic reviews as well. We hope that the show will leave a little bit of a legacy. Um, it was bringing this sort of 1990s debate about what the Celts are to um, a museum audience really for the first time. Um, but there were also things um, that we feel it was doing that were new um, and which are, are still there in the, the book. Sorry, I sound like I'm pushing the book. Um, but uh, things like placing these objects really into their social context not just looking at them as art objects, but thinking about them as powerful things that are used by people um, within their lives um, and to create and represent particular worlds. Um, we also were trying to place Britain very firmly in its wider European context. Um, we can't tell the story um, of these islands without um, looking at Europe, and I think the same is true in reverse as well. Um, and also, we were trying to make sure um, that we were really representing objects from this sort of, you know, really, really great span of time, really, really great geographical spread in a way that hadn't been done before. And um, so in that sense, um, we did get a lot of good feedback um, that people were starting to sort of get this story, um, but also um, hopefully there are things that we've been able to add to that. And a really big one of those, um, which comes out from that breadth of material and that geographical diversity as well, um, is this idea that Fraser touched on the beginning about different Celtic arts. That the idea that that has to be a plural idea, it can't be something that is singular, because so much of this material um, is in fact very different. And that although all of these are powerful objects, they're being used in very different contexts, at very different times, by very different people. There were objects that we would have loved to include but couldn't, uh, that couldn't travel um, for whatever reason. Um, illustrated here, just a selection of those that I know we would both have loved to have. Um, the incredible Ardai Chalice um, from the National Museum of Ireland. Um, the Tintinia Carnix um, that I'm sure, as you can imagine, Fraser in particular, um, to put next to um, the brilliant um, Carnix um, from the Scottish collections would have been um, wonderful to have and um, with its fabulous ear still in place um, but unfortunately it's too fragile to travel um, and likewise this incredible disc um, here from the Roissy chariot burial um, in France which is actually quite a recent archaeological discovery within I think the last 10 years um, really showcasing just that incredible swirling designs and here if you um, look at the cursor you can see the little faces of horse-like creatures swirling around this um, sort of central ball. Um, but I think um, even though we weren't able to include all of the pieces we would have liked, um, hopefully we had certainly enough um, breadth of objects in every sense um, to tell the stories that we wanted to tell. And um, so uh, I'm not going to talk you through the word clouds again, um, but uh, you can see here these are from the panels of the London show and the Scottish show. And so I just wanted to sort of finish by emphasising that the two exhibitions and the book um, was very much a sort of shared project, but within which um, we were lucky enough to have um, enough wiggle room to tell different perspectives on that same story, um, which suited our different audiences. Um, and um, I feel, and I hope Fraser feels too, um, that um, overall the project was really successful um, and hopefully will leave a little bit um, of a legacy behind as well. So thank you very much.